Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, uh, the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. And basically, I developed this uh, company because my mom lived with dementia for 30 years. And for me, it was life changing. I felt a strong need to connect people to services, products, and tools around the world because I wasn't finding them as a daughter. And I thought people deserved better. We also have a platform called Dementia Chats where I interview people with dementia who are the true experts. And today we are lucky to have a man living with dementia all the way from London with us, Peter Berry, who is such an inspiration to so many people around the world. I have heard people who are living with dementia, care partners and business professionals all rave about about this man. And so I'm so honored to have him on our show today. To, to help inspire us how to live better with dementia. You see, Peter was um, diagnosed with dementia at the age of 50, and he is determined to continue to live his life fully in a positive manner, just like he always has. And he's not willing to just hand his life over to dementia like many people do. They become the diagnosis, and Peter wants to remain Peter first, so align with and admire. As I said, uh, Peter lives in London with his his wife. He just formally retired a few months ago from a family business. His father developed and created a, a lumber company. And he'll talk a little bit more about why he stepped down and, and how all of that occurred and how, how the disease, um, how his dementia has affected not only himself but his family at large so welcome peter hi laurie it's wonderful to be here um yeah that's really great thank you so much and i i never realized that um that my videos went as as far as they did so it's um yeah it's um it's it's, it's pretty cool social media is pretty powerful and i think it's still underrated by a lot of large companies they don't they don't understand the power of the connections People no. are looking for authentic voices, you know, to just say what they're feeling and be honest with the good, the bad, and the ugly and, and forge forward and try to live fully. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a beautiful thing and um, you're doing I a often, wonderful um, job. I often think that the professionals, they know the mechanics of, of dementia and Alzheimer's. But I don't think you can really truly know anything until you're actually living with it 24-7. And I'm so fortunate at this stage in my journey, if you like, that I am able to, to portray the feelings in, I suppose, in, in layman terms that, um, that just about anybody can understand. And I think it's, it's had a great impact because when I do my videos, people say you know what yeah 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 this is what we're living with nobody has said this before and that before and it's it's good for people to understand that they're not alone they're not alone on this journey and other people are having exactly the same issues as them it's not just them just on their own and that's it's very important to know that there is a family out there um albeit an international uh, family on the web or whatever but it, it's still a communication Exactly. Well, and I think one of the things that is so important is, um, like you'd mentioned, professionals talk about symptoms, but they don't talk about the reactions to the symptoms, how that how it makes that person feel or how it makes other people feel. And we're not going to have effective change if we don't get down to how it makes us interact with one another. And, uh, you know, what is our comfort level? And I, to me, when I speak and train, that's one of the things I always push is that we have to look much deeper than just identifying symptoms. It's just not enough. 
Now, I would love for you to share a little bit with our audience um, who hasn't maybe seen your videos um, about how you got diagnosed and um, how long that took to do. Okay, yeah. Well, as you all know, I was diagnosed at the age of 50. Um, that, it, it took my wife about three years to get a diagnosis. So it was in my late 40s. Um, it started off really where, when I was running the business, um, my wife noticed that I was struggling with certain elements that had been quite easy up until that point. Uh, mathematics, my short-term memory, lots of things were happening. And I, I had this idea that maybe it was just because there was a lot going on. And I suppose maybe also being a stubborn male, maybe um, we don't like to, to give in to these things. Um, I think one of the main bombshells actually was when somebody came into the lumber mill and had ordered some timber uh, a few hours previous and they come to pick that order up and uh, I had no knowledge of them coming. I had no knowledge at all. This had happened apparently quite a few times prior and of course I had no knowledge of that as well. So we went through this procedure, this three-year procedure of getting a diagnosis. It takes a long while in this country, especially for people in my age group. And I think a majority of that is, or most of that is, because they try to outrule so many other conditions prior, one of them being depression. Eventually, after a long while, we got this diagnosis. And it was, it was okay for me to accept it. I mean, I, I didn't actually realize or even dream that I had Alzheimer's. I thought I'd got a brain tumor or something. So as far as I'm concerned, hey, this was a winner. You know, I, I wasn't going to die of a brain tumor. I'd got Alzheimer's. That's fine. We can live with that. No problem. How wrong could I have been? After getting home, and I suppose over the next few weeks, the enormity of what was going to come with this diagnosis, how things were going to change, how my life was going to change, this journey that I was on, and how were my family going to cope? All of these things weighed very heavy on my shoulders. And I went into, for about a year, a, a very, very deep depression. It, it got to such a point, I think, where I had this, this idea that, do you know what, the world would be a better place without me. My family would get on better without me because I was going to be a bird. And I think it was at that point in time where at the lowest ebb that I realized that there was nobody helping us. So there was nobody helping the 40 odd other thousand mm. people out there with young dementia in this country. And that was the bombshell. I suppose that was the inspiration that I needed to carry on because we all need a purpose in life and Alzheimer's in our age group or any age group come to that can take that purpose away. So I come to realize that I knew what it was like to be depressed and have all of these issues. So we, we, decided, we decided to start raising awareness by, by doing talks, public speaking, to help others to adjust to their dementia, to help others to live well, because life with dementia is not over. It's just a bit different. And the other problem is that people's perception of dementia is different to the reality. So the general public needed to be educated because everybody says, oh, well, I forget things. You know, we all forget things. Well, that's one of the worst things you can say to somebody with dementia because it's not about just forgetting. It's about a whole array of things. So that's sort of where we are now from being diagnosed three years ago to where we are now. And we have a purpose, we have a role in life again. And um, as you said, being retired now gives me so much time to do all this stuff. Well, you know, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, with the doctors, they're, they're weeding out so many different things because you, they're not educated that this is a possibility then you could even have this disease at your age. And Absolutely. I think we, we find that all around the world. And yet <clears throat> most of us, you know, rely on our doctors to sort this out. And so I think that's where the power of the conversation comes in 
because a lot of individuals, I mean, I didn't know what Alzheimer's was until my mom got it. It wasn't talked about. You know, that was a long time ago, so it was even worse than it is now. Yeah, and, sure, um, absolutely. And yet, um, you know, the resources are lacking, and yet resources can't be developed if we don't have conversations, if we don't talk about real needs, if we don't talk about the importance of not just getting a, a brochure that gives you all the gloom and doom, but allows you to connect and continue and to know that you can still live a purpose-filled life. Um, one of the things I hear from people with uh, living with dementia a lot is they've never felt so purposeful until now. Well, you know, I, I often say to people that my life is richer with Alzheimer's than it was before. Not in monetary terms, but in the positive things that I do. The, I suppose, the wealth of friends that I've got. People who are in the same situation. Nobody is trying to outdo anybody or be better than somebody. There's no competition. We're all on that same journey and we all have the same issues. And yeah, so my life is a richer place with it. And I'm a great believer in trying to inspire others to, to, to actually move forward. One of the things that I did, and I'll, I'll just share this with you now, as these things pop into my head, I come to believe that in order to actually deal with my condition, I needed to take it out of my head. I needed to give it an identity. I needed to have Alzheimer's as a form that I could poke and prod and probably make fun of. So I came up with this, this idea of, of this little humpty dumpty round fat man with a pointed nose and rather a grumpy look on his face. And I love cycling. And I often say to people that when I go cycling, I leave my dementia at home. It is sitting there on the settee, twiddling its thumbs, waiting for me to come back. It's not in control, I'm in control. And everybody should have that opportunity to leave their condition where it is and move away from it. Caregivers and people with the condition as well. It gives you time to, to focus on other things. And if I dare say, it gives you time to forget your dementia, if, if that's the right term. Well, you know, I like that attitude because uh, I think one of the things that we end up believing with any chronic illness is you know, we, we, we tend to frame that this isn't how we pictured our lives, which again, nobody signs up for a chronic illness, you know, or, or no one I've met so far anyways has that, hey, what about me? Um, but, you know, our, our life was never perfect before dementia entered our world. And, and I, think, I think both people with dementia and care partners and friends put that expectation on that it was. You know, and we, we throughout life are constantly adapting as we age, as we move, change jobs, get married, divorce, have babies. All of it, it's a constant adaption. And this is one more adapting factor. And, and I'm a true believer in attitude, you know, frames your world. And attitude um, can give you gratitude if you choose you know, yes. to live life and be thankful for. And one of the things that I hear from so many of the, the great advocates out there for dementia like yourself who are living with it is that they are grateful for each and every moment before them. They, they are, are grateful for rich, authentic conversations. And, um, you know, with your videos reaching, you know, this international span that I know you weren't even aware of how far they go, um, wow. <clears throat> which is, that's social media, but um, uh, so many um, businesses and and experts out there would tell me over and over, well, those aren't true relationships, and yet I would hear from people, and I would experience it myself, how deep and rich these relationships are via social media, and I think it's because people aren't just talking about the weather or a sports game. Well, do you know, the actual, the, the videos, actually, I'll, I'll just say this, they were the idea of my daughter, um, because I was writing everything down in a journal, and 
over a period of time, dementia took my ability to write. I can write a few sentences or a few words, but I can't put my thoughts down on paper. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And this is a man who used to write, oh, 50 odd pages of reports. And now the most I can do is half a sentence. So my daughter said to me, she said, you know what, Dad? She said, make a video. And I thought, what is she going on about? How am I going to make a video? So she showed me. And we had this idea that we would probably make four, maybe eight videos in total. We never, ever dreamt for one second that they would go as far and wide as they have, and they would have such an impact. Now, the whole idea of the videos was to help people with dementia and their caregivers to understand it. But I never dreamt for one second that it would work the other way around. Now the videos are helping me because I do them every Friday. I look forward to doing them. It, it's giving me another purpose. And that's, that's the complete turnaround that, um, that I never, never, ever dreamt of. And we've done so many wonderful things. I cycled across to Great Britain um, at the end of June. Um, we cycled across Great Britain to raise money for Young Dementia UK, which we raised about £5,000. And I also wanted to challenge my dementia. I wanted to challenge the very thing that had brought me to my knees. I wanted to show it that I could still do. But the most important thing is I wanted to inspire others to show them that if a normal guy could get up with dementia and cycle across the country, then other people could get on their bikes. They could cycle, walk, run, garden, do anything they wanted to do. Because it's not just about me, it's about everybody else. And it's all about inspiring others. And um, as I've probably said before, which I don't know if I, I can't remember or not, that's dementia, but you know, life's not over. It is different, but it's not over, not by a long way. People with dementia have so much to give. And I often say to people, don't talk about people with dementia, talk to them, because people will learn so much. Well, and that is brilliant advice. And I, I want to talk about your cycling because, mm. you know, they talk about exercise is helpful and you're getting more oxygen to the brain. And so, um, you know, that's a wonderful thing. But like you said, it's about raising awareness. You've raised funds. And I know that you are planning next year to expand on what you yes. did and make it more interactive with the communities. Can you talk about yeah, that? Um, we've, the, the, the first challenge was really just, I suppose, really, as I said, to challenge me and to help others but, and to raise money. But this time next, uh, next June, we want to get more people involved. We want to go around Britain from one landmark to another landmark and we want to, to stop and, and halfway through, talk to schools, um, uh, talk to towns. We want to get people out to cycle with us. Whether they cycle two miles, 10 miles, five miles, it's up to them. It's all about a joint effort. It's not just about us cycling around to raise awareness. It's about getting people out. And hey, you don't have to have dementia. You can come anyway. Even It doesn't matter whether you've got a condition or not. Just come and join us. Make it a big event. Make it something, something to raise awareness, something that people can remember. And I've got this idea that maybe every year something like this could be done because I want to challenge myself every year. And, uh, and, and I want it to be... I want it to be something that will continue long after I can't do it because there's people being diagnosed all the while. People are at the start of this journey today. They've been at the start of this journey last week. There's people who, like me, who are being diagnosed three years, 10 years, but there's always others who need, who need that little boost. They need that little bit of encouragement. So to do something every year is, is great. So we're going to do four counties of, of, um, of England. And um, each county, we're going to stop, like I say, at a school or a town, do a talk, raise as much awareness as we can. And the reason I cycle, I don't drive anymore. And um, we live rurally, so I just love biking. I just love getting on there and pushing them pedals down. It's, 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 it's awesome. It really is. 
Well, that is wonderful. And I, one of the other things that I love about you getting out there and cycling is there are so many people that can tap into their own passions, their own natural passions. You know, cycling is one for you. I remember seeing, and I remember hearing this comment from somebody going, well, what are all those motorcycles doing? And there was a, a big motorcycle run that was raising funds. And, um, you know, dementia doesn't leave anybody out of the loop. It can touch anybody in Gosh. any status or culture or whatever. And so I just think it's phenomenal. And and it affects not just the person, like you said, with dementia, it affects the, the family and the friends. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that too, in terms of how did how did you as a family handle this? You mentioned you you know were depressed um, for probably the first year, and I would imagine that had a little ripple effect with the family as well. It had it actually it had a, 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 a quite a devastating effect on the family. Um, my daughter. I mean, let's face it, dads and daughters, I mean, dads can make the sunshine. We can do anything as far as daughters are concerned. All of a sudden, she had a dad who couldn't do the things that he did do. Now, I, I will just say this, the perception of the diagnosis is a funny thing because I had dementia three years before a diagnosis, but it wasn't until actually some a doctor said to me, you have early onset Alzheimer's then it's when it changes everything but it shouldn't really because it probably takes them no more than 15 seconds to say them words and in actual fact i was no different person after them 15 seconds than i was before i was exactly the same person i hadn't changed it was only hearing those words that had changed me and it, it changed the whole family my wife got quite i think she got quite depressed about it and we didn't do anything we just yeah the family became how can i say stagnant it, it, it just became a machine that just moved and, and that was it there was no there was no feeling the house didn't really have the laughter in it and and the joyous stuff that that, that family houses have but when i got out of my depression and when i found a purpose again i think my family realized that you know what hey dad is is coping okay he's he's doing all right really he's he's not too bad now and that lifted the rest of the family because they could see that i was doing okay so me doing badly rippled out me doing well rippled out and it was that doing well that changed everything so where are we at now three years after that yeah we're a happy family we laugh we have fun we go out and we do stuff. Things are different, but we work around it. And the different has become normal, if that makes sense. I don't drive, haven't driven now for probably a couple of years. When I first stopped driving, my wife found that difficult to accept because she had to drive anywhere. And now if I was to get in the car, she said, you out there, this is my car, I'm driving this. So it's a different thing now. And we all become, how can I say, we're living alongside dementia if that makes sense we're we're working in with it and yes there are bad days there it's just not all sweet and roses there are days where alzheimer's really does get to me and i can't do much but the bad days there's nowhere near as many of those as there are the good days so we make the most of the good stuff oh that's wonderful and i I love how you said, you know, your depression rippled out, but so so did your joy and your purpose rippled yep. out. And I, I think in this fast paced world that we live, we forget about how we impact everybody around us, if we know them or not. And uh, to me, uh, and people think that I'm crazy when I say this, but in so many ways, I see dementia as one of the, well, for me personally, my mom's dementia journey was the largest gift I'll ever receive in my life. Taught me so many fabulous lessons. And I always thought I was a good person before, but I think I'm a much better person now. I think I'm less judgmental and more accepting and um, 
towards others. And I probably need to do a, a less critical talk yapping at myself still, and <laughs> more accepting, <laughs> you know. Um, and and just letting go of all the things that we really have been told we're in control of that we're not. And and that is such a huge burden lifted, you know, when you can just start accepting what is there and and making the most out of it. it it's it's a beautiful thing to watch. And it, it brings me to another topic because, again, I think a lot of this starts with the doctors. Like you said, in 15 seconds, your world and your family and friends' worlds changed yeah. by words. And, yeah. and words matter. And so what are some, you know, they, and, they, and when we leave the doctor's office, they kind of set us up to, you know, get your papers in order. And, you know, they don't leave it just at those words. They're, they tell you you're, you're dying and, you know, you better take this seriously instead of saying, you know, you better live life to the fullest because, you know, and none of us know how long we have. I mean, my mom lived 30 years with dementia. People yeah. would to told me that's impossible. She can't have it. I'm like, she it's because she's been honest and open about it. Yeah. You know, when many people, many people weren't about their symptoms. Um, but let's talk about, words that matter like I know uh, talk about the word suffering or sufferer what oh. your thoughts are on that well now that's um yeah suffering do I suffer with dementia um the answer to that is no I do not no I live with dementia I don't suffer it suffer with it so who suffers with dementia my family they're the ones that suffer because I'm in my own little world. I'm in my bubble. Um, I am in the here and now. I don't see the failings that they see. I don't see the things that I forget. I don't see the problems that I have from the inside out. From the outside in, they're the ones who are watching, I suppose, all the things that go wrong. They're the ones who remember the bad stuff. I don't. I don't remember it. So when people say, you know, he's suffering with dementia, it's not right at all. Everyone else around us suffer and, and we don't. And, you know, it's, it's difficult for, for my family because I'll go in the kitchen, as I know most people do with this condition, and we will open most of the cupboards and the drawers trying to find the things that have been in the same place for years um, because we don't know where they are. And... So we label cupboards and drawers and, and that sort of thing. There's always a way around it. But I think for those around us, seeing that, and I, I'm going to use the word demise, even though it's not really a demise, but it, it, it's just for the context of, of this recording, that I think it's, it's very, very hard for those people. And, um, yeah, I, I really do feel for others around me. I really do. Are there other words that that you just think could be tweaked or stated better that people use? Well, um, yes. I mean, you know, we say sufferer. And also, I think the way that people talk around people with dementia. As, as soon as somebody is said, you know, oh, you know, I have dementia or I have Alzheimer's, people's whole mannerism changes completely straight away. And, and the reality is that nine times out of 10, if somebody had a 10 minute conversation with you or with us and they didn't know that we had this condition, they would walk away and they wouldn't know any difference at all. So people's use of, of, of terms of knowledge, they, you know, um, can he manage to carry that? Um, they, 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 people try and assist you like you have, I don't know, a sort of a disability. Well, I suppose we do have a disability. But we can we can work around it. We don't need to be, I suppose, shrouded in cotton wool. Well, I don't anyway. I'm 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 quite happy to 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 make a mess of things and, and try and put it right. It's it's, it's all good. But um, yeah, I think and the thing is in this country, I don't know what it's like um, over the pond, as they say, but in this country, awareness is gradually changing. We have um, dementia friendly towns. Uh, dementia friendly shops we have um, we're starting to get supermarkets with with um, 
check out aisles that are a little slower and a little better so that people don't treat us like a second class citizens and treat us i don't know differently and and i think um a classic example and here's something that's never popped into my mind me and my wife will go to the supermarket and somebody will say to my wife while i'm standing there oh how's he getting on as though i'm not there believe it or not and they can ask me i'm, I'm quite happy to tell so yeah i just think that it's not that people are being nasty on purpose it's not that people want to be cruel it's just that people don't quite understand and um, it's getting better but it's 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 taking time and maybe it would be a good idea if everybody with dementia went around with a big bandage around our heads because then people could see that something's wrong <laughs> maybe that might be the way i don't know <laughs> <laughs> well i think it's it's interesting when you mentioned about somebody coming up and you're standing right there and posing a question to your wife because i hear that all the time I'm and sure, people yeah. are so uncomfortable with what do I do, but no one asks, how should I behave? How can I help? It's, it's like this tiptoe thing, or else they, they pull away. Did you find any family or friends pull away from you because of the disease? Yes, yeah, we have. Um, I mean, I, I understand that people are busy, and, and old school friends are busy, and they have lives to lead, and I wouldn't want them to come here all the while. But um, I have one great school buddy um he comes to see me once a week um we go for a coffee we have a chat or whatever and and that's good but to be honest with you a lot of people drift away because you know they don't know how to talk to the guy with dementia um they don't know you know and, and some people will say you know i didn't know if to talk to him because i didn't know if he'd remember my name well hey if i forget your name it doesn't matter i can still talk to you you know it's it's it yeah so and in actual fact, family do tend to drift away. Um, and again, I think it's not because they're trying to be unkind. I think it's just because they don't understand and they're so afraid that they might say the wrong thing. But the reality is, I'm still me. I'm still the same guy. I'm still the same person. And one of the other things that we get a lot, and, and I'm sure you get it in this, in this country, my wife will explain to somebody that I've got this condition. and this person will say, oh, I know, because I forget a lot as well. And it's, it's a little bit of an insult to, to, to people with the condition because they don't understand it's not all about memory. It's about um, your attitude. It's about, I don't know, the way that you perceive everything. And it, 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 it affects so much of our lives. It affects our attitude. It affects our well-being. And it, it changes a person's personality as well that's another thing somebody can go from being very happy and an unaggressive to quite a grumpy aggressive person without really realizing it. so um yeah there's lots of different things but but family do tend to drift away but i'm very fortunate because i do have a great load of cycling buddies and um and they're really good because um yeah we, we cycle together in actual fact they don't care whether the guy's got dementia just as long as he can ride a bike <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's cool i like that as long as you can still pedal yeah well that, yeah, exactly that is great that. it it is interesting how uncomfortable people can feel um and again that just shows the need for more awareness in education and and having open conversations you know over a, if it's a glass of wine or a dinner table or you yeah, know a sure. cup of coffee it, it's okay yeah. to to ask you know, I tell people it's it's not contagious. If they come and sit next to me or they come into the house, they're not going to get dementia, you know? You're, you'll be fine, guys. It's cool. Yeah. Well, and I find that some people stay away because they're having symptoms and yes. they're, they're deathly afraid that they, too, might, you know, have a diagnosis, but they aren't going to the doctor. They aren't doing anything. And so for them, it's a reminder instead of being able to look at someone like you and how you're still living fully, how you continue to embrace life. But again, we have to, we have to start with the, the business professionals and the medical professionals yeah, giving yeah. that message that it's, it's okay to live. And, 
here in the U.S., I think we have the same problem, you know, with the education and what is is the message fear-based to raise money or is it about giving hope and resources? And yeah. one of the, the things that I have fought from day one here is I, you might get someone to dig into their pocket because they're scared initially, let's say with if they have someone who loves who has the disease, but then they're going to run as fast as they can as soon as that journey is over. But if you give people hope and support and build community, they will stay with you and, and they will add value throughout the whole process. And there's so many different ways to add value that, that isn't just about the dollar, you know, it's, it's about that personal connection, the support or the contacts or the physical resources that somebody might have to have a memory cafe or I, I, there's just so many different things. And, and I think it's important for us to watch the, the words that we use because this isn't a bed in a bag disease. You know, it's not something where, okay, if you go, if you follow steps one through five, things are going to be perfect because every person is different. Every care partner is different. Every environment is different. And, and bottom line, every moment is different. And, and that applies to all of us. And a lot of times, I think we as outsiders, those who aren't diagnosed, cause a lot of the issues for people with dementia because we're not even realizing how we're affecting somebody because we're, we're moving along so fast. We're not aware of our body language. We're not, you know, we're not um, realizing that people will mirror back exactly what we're doing and we're not even aware we're doing it. And so that's to me one of the beautiful gifts of dementia is it can make you look within yes. on who are you as a person and how are, how are others perceiving you. And, um, you know, you might think you're not judgmental, but your body language is screaming it. You haven't spoke the words. <laughs> You know, but but everything else is flashing red lights. So I think that that is um, uh, is very very important as well. There's and a I, there's a great emphasis at the moment, and there's there's a, a, a lot going on in this country at the moment um, regarding peer support. Um, as you say, um, small uh, cafes, small groups getting together um, with the same condition. It gives the caregivers a chance to to talk to other people in their situation, and it also gives people like us a chance to talk to our peers as well, people who are in the same situation as us. And those those little support groups are invaluable. Um, they're they're very, they don't cost a lot of money, and people tend to look after themselves. They they tend to go to a calf and. And, and, and do their own thing, it, it evolves. And what starts off as, as a little group of maybe four or five people can soon build up to 10, 12, 15, and, and, and 20 upwards. And um, it becomes great because you then have this social network. And if somebody is at the, the same place in that journey as you, then you move with them. And, and they move with you. And that's, um, that's very important. And there's a, there's a great lot of focus on about that in, in this country at the moment. I had the um, opportunity talking with Norms McNamara, you know, he told me about the memory cafes. And so I brought that concept over to the U.S., but here we don't have funding. And so I, I aligned with a perfect partner who just gave us space and um, staff to, to help us with this. And, and yet we, we don't really have dollars per se, but so many times, and I just found this hilarious because we would bring the care partner and the person with dementia together. And that's, our groups don't typically split off. And, but the comment I would get over and over and over was, oh, they, they can't be in a group together. And I'm like, well, where do you think they are the rest of the day? This is about learning to live graciously alongside the disease. and the power within the group, because once in a while, <clears throat> somebody will say something that, you know, uh, the rest of the group might think isn't as respectful as it should be, but they, they correct and support both individuals at the same time, knowing none of them are perfect either, and they've snapped at times too, or said something that wasn't appropriate, and 
and it's not judged. You know, it's just lifted, it's understood, it's it's respected, and you know, they talk about doing things better and understanding, like you had mentioned earlier, you know, you're you're five steps ahead of somebody else and ten steps behind somebody else. And and that's the beauty of it. There's always learning and that there, this is a two-way street of learning. It's not just about here in the U.S., um, people with dementia say, you know, why is there so much support for our, for our care partners and not for us? And we're starting to see more of those individual meetup groups or acknowledgement yeah. that, yeah. that you need support too. Everybody does. And everybody needs a break from one another. You oh, know? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's, without a doubt. It's, it's, it's very important stuff, and, and it's nice to see they're finally doing some research on social support and the power of that. It's not all, all the research isn't going, um, though most of it, towards a pill and a cure. Um, they are looking at other things like sleep and diet and exercise and social engagement and the arts and, and you know, because nobody knows what causes this. So we can't nope. fix what we don't know the cause of. And we're not going to figure out the cause if we don't have these conversations like we're having today. So, Peter, I, I just, I, I so respect what you're doing. And it has just Thank been you. such a pleasure to have you on the show with us today. I, I just, I feel so honored and I can't wait for more people to learn of the work that you're doing and the life that you're sharing and, and living and empowering others to do the same. Raising awareness is key, and, and I often say to people that one voice in the dark is lost, but many voices are heard. And if I can teach a handful of people a little bit about dementia during public speaking or videos or whatever, they can take that knowledge away and they can amplify it further. And it becomes, it becomes that many voices, and they're the ones, then we all get heard. And, uh, yeah, and there's so many people like me doing stuff, raising awareness. Um, some people write books, some people write poems, and all of those sort of things. And it's all part of, of that one engine to move forward. And it's, it's, so, it's so important. And it, it's great to be on here and talk to you guys. I never dreamt two years ago that, that I would be talking to people in the USA. I didn't. I, I really didn't. And um, so, you know. Yeah, it's so it all moves forward. And how cool is that? The wonder of technology. <laughs> well, and I, I started out the same way, you know, in 2009, when I started my blog, I was encouraged by colleagues to kind of tell my story. And so I honestly didn't know if they were tired of hearing my stories and thought, give her another outlet so she goes away or if it was really of value. And so when I started the blog, I too was shocked that people around the world were connecting with me. And so through the radio, through the videos, through the website, it's just been so much fun. And it has expanded my world significantly. And I have learned so much from other people's stories. And, and I just think, you know, I, I'm so grateful for that. Because again, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, we are here to, to not only live life fully, but to constantly learn and try to improve the world and make it a better place. And I think we all have the power to do that. And it is um, amazing when you find kind of your true authentic voice, um, how that resonates with others and how it inspires them to to dip their toe in and go, well, maybe, maybe I too could yeah. do something that matters. Um, because I think so often people feel lost and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 60 next year. And I think especially at my age, people are wondering, what is my purpose? What have I really done with my life? Yeah. Yeah. And when you find that space, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing place to be. It is. It's it's an amazing place to be. Now, um, one of the easiest ways for people to reach you is just to go on Facebook 
and um, we have the we'll have the link there. Uh, but just put in Peter Berry, and um, and actually your Facebook link is Peter dot Berry, and that's B E R R Y dot three nine five eight. Or are you open for people to email you as well? Absolutely, that's not a problem at all um, because I, I do have somebody who, who helps me with the, with the emails because if I get more than about two emails, it, it, it all goes wrong. But I've got a wonderful lady who helps me do all that, so that's absolutely great. And if people want to access um, uh, the videos, they can there. My daughter set up a YouTube channel, which was basically for a library for me. But in actual fact, there's quite a few subscribers on there now. Most of the people watch the videos on Facebook, but they can go and watch them. And I know that if you put into YouTube, Peter Berry, Alzheimer's, the videos will come up. There's all 63 of them, I think there is now in, in total. Um, and people can start at one and, and go right the way through. So they're all there. They all have different subjects for different weeks. Um, me, I can't remember any of them, but every now and again I go and have a look at them because they're a great resource for me as, as a library to see what, what I've done over the last year and, and, and a bit. So, yeah, so Peter Berry, um, Alzheimer's, and, and they'll come up on YouTube. Wonderful. Well, Peter, again, I can't thank you um, enough for your time and, and sharing um, uh, sharing just a piece of yourself with us. And I encourage people to follow you on Facebook and follow you on YouTube as well. Uh, you will learn so much and you'll get connected again to an expanded network of people because people comment and, <clears throat> and have conversations and you know, it's, uh, it's, well, if it's, anybody ever wants to ask me any questions, um, I will always do my best to answer them because, you know, inside knowledge is, is always key. So if people want to ask me a question about diagnosis or anything to do with, um, with, with dementia, early onset Alzheimer's, I will always answer the question. I'll do the best I can. Nine times out of 10, I don't write to people because that ability is gone and I don't get my PA to do it because I feel as though it's got to come from me and not somebody else. But normally, if somebody asks me a question throughout the week, I will answer it that Friday on the weekly video. And um, that way, not one person gets the answer, but thousands of people get the answer so it, it spreads and uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in answering stuff personally to make it I don't know just to make it a personal thing wonderful well again thank you so much for your time and in wrapping up I just think this ties in really nicely to what we're talking to I just think we need to make the world a kinder place we have to be less judgmental more accepting and truly get to know one another and, and connect on a, on a deeper level than what we do uh, normally on our day-to-day run-of-the-mill life. So oh, I thank agree you. with that statement entirely. Great. And of course, you can always go to alzheimerspeaks.com for further information on our various initiatives and, um, and tools that are available there as well. So thank you all so much for watching and please share this video. That's why we do. Bye now.